the reason why death, dying, and grief um, feels very uncomfortable to some people is because we haven't normalized the talk around it. These are things that are going to happen in your life. They are a normal part of your life. If you're uncomfortable with it, it just means that you're not in a you're not in a space where you're ready yet, right? Tony, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited for the conversation. To start, I'm sure a lot of listeners aren't familiar with you, so why don't you explain a little bit about your uh, yourself, a little bit about where you come from, and what you've been through? Yeah, um, my name is Tony Lynch. I am the founder of the nonprofit Memories of Us. I'm a men's grief coach uh, and podcaster. I am, I, I'm in Colorado, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. I have been here for 32 years now. I'm originally from uh, Newport News, Virginia. And uh, as they say, I've had a, I've had a very unique journey in, in, in this world, you know, um, Grief has been my mentor, but um, my journey started when I was six. Um, and I, I can dive in. I could talk a little bit about that. You know, at the age of six, um, I was molested by my neighbor's son and his mom and my mom used to be best of friends. And um, I guess you could say, man, I, I learned how to protect myself at a very early age. You know, um, and that's really where where it all started. You know, from the age of six is when I really understood the world. I grew up very fast. I understood the world. I understood that there was people capable of doing really bad things to people in this world. And had it had not happened to me, I would still be naive in this world growing up. Although I would have still probably, you know, figured it out somewhat because of where I grew up at, you know. Um, but yeah, at an early age, when that happened to me, um, it changed me. It, it changed me, something fierce, you know, um, and I learned how to be very mischievous. And uh, what I mean by that, I learned, I learned the fine art of playing 3D chess, right? Because after that happened, I made a decision. No one's ever going to hurt me again. At the age of six, when that happens to you, it it, it does something to you, right? You know, I I tried to kill him. I tried to kill him out there. I stuck a knife in his stomach. And um, I told him, I said, you'll never touch me again. You'll never touch me again. And he never touched me anymore after that. Um, but in the same sense, I'm still my mom's, my mother's boy. You know, I'm still my sister's brother. So I had to, I had to be that. But although this terrible thing had just happened to me, there was a part of me that just didn't care about the world at the age of six. I was like, I don't care because if a person is able to do that to me, then I have to be able to do something even worse to them. You know, you're not going to hurt me. That was my philosophy. You're not going to hurt me. So on the other side of that, I was my I was I was a straight A student. I was graduating early from school. I was my sister's protector. I was my father's son. I was the ideal kid. I was quiet. I stayed to myself. I loved art. I I rode, you know, I I rode my skateboard. I played my friends. But on the other side, um, I was tinkering around. I, I, I say for the next couple of years, I started being affiliated with the gang. Right. You know, hanging out with certain people, you know, it wasn't that the lifestyle really fascinated, um, really fascinated me. I knew everybody. But it was when I first started, it was what it stood for. It stood for protecting your neighborhood, protecting the kids, watching out for the elderly, rebuilding our communities. Right. And um, and the gang that I'm talking about was Crips, you know, and um I've been around for a very, very long time. I was there from, let's see, I really started getting into it at the age of 11 because that's when I started selling drugs. And I did that for four years from the age of 11 to the age of 15. When they finally busted me, um, they, they said I was the youngest and the biggest drug dealer in the state of Virginia. 
Mm-hmm. I said, what? What do you mean? And when they finally counted up the money, I'm talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars I had made from selling drugs and guns and all these different things. And then the crazy part about it was is that I never intended on doing that. I, I just I just wanted to be able to put food in the house, you know, put a little money in my mom's in my mom's purse. So she didn't have to, you know, we, we grew up poor, right? I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't very fancy or anything like that. I, I mean, I just wanted to buy my sister Barbie dolls, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, I just wanted to buy my sister Barbie dolls. And next thing you know, I'm out of control. Um, and when they did finally bust me, they couldn't lock me up because just like they had me, I had them too. I didn't realize that the people I was dealing with were big names, you know, not the, not the drug dealers I was getting the drugs from, but I'm talking about like police officers, lawyers, judges, things like that. People that I was actually getting information from, you know, and uh, 15, I left home. Um, I said, I, I, I made a lot of bad choices. At 15, I left home and, um, Went to Washington, D.C. for two years. Best time of my life. Best time of my life. I left the gangs alone, right? I'm, I'm playing football. I'm, I'm teaching martial arts at the time. I'm, I'm taking Kung Fu. I'm boxing. I'm playing football. And uh, I meet my oldest daughter's mom there, right, in D.C. And uh, I was there for two years, from 90 to 92. I got, and I left in 92. And we had our daughter, Tatiana, and we moved to Colorado in 1992. I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to be a good father. I'm going to raise her. You know, we're going to raise her as a family. And, um, you know, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to not gonna do I'm not gonna do the whole game bang thing. I'm not going to do the drug thing. I'm going to do this thing honestly. Well, when I say that life had a different um, plan for me, it really did. I just didn't know. So in 1992, um, my daughter was around six months old at the time. And we, I remember we was walking back to, to the place that we were living. And uh, there were some Crips playing basketball on the court. And I just remember walking over, I see him. I got, you know, I'm dressed in armor room because I'm not trying to do the whole game bang thing, you know. Yeah. And, but but I'm, tat- I'm tatted up, you know, I'm, I'm tatted up on, on both of my arms. So this guy don't know this, but he comes over because I'm in Maroon and he goes, oh man, you know, it starts this, it starts this whole thing. And I'm just looking at him like, okay, whatever, man, whatever. And then he gets in my face and he says, you know what? I'm going to kill you. I was like, no, you're not. That's, that's what we're not going to do. And I beat that kid half to death. Hmm. And when I did that, I saw my daughter's mom and she had this look of fear in her face. Because she had heard about me doing things like that, but she, she's, she's never seen that side of me. So when she saw that side of me, the reality of it came to her. She was like, whoa, this dude, this dude is really about that life. I was like, man, I can't do this. Because I knew at that moment, my journey was about to get really bad. So I told her, I said, you know, a couple of days later, I said, like, take her. And you get far as away from me as you possibly can. Just take her and go. I won't, I won't follow you, but I can't have you here with me because this is not going to let me go. I just ran from one state and ran right back into it in another state. No matter where I go, it's going to follow me. I have to see this thing through if I survive. And so she did. She took my daughter. She left. And uh, I didn't follow. Him. I didn't ask. You know, I said, hey, if you need anything, you let me know. I'll get it to you. You know, but. um. You know, other than that, that you can't be around me. You cannot be around me. That was the hardest thing I ever did because I thought about their safety and not being selfish in that sense. And now I tell you, from that point on, I was so deep into it. I mean, I was, I was cousin and I mean, all the things that came along with it. 1994, I went to prison. For five years for a crime I never committed. But they still gave me the time. And I did five years. Two of those five years, um, I spent in solitary confinement. 
Now, during this time, I'm losing people. I'm in prison. Prison riots are starting. I'm getting blamed for all kinds of stuff. I was like, man, this is crazy. I ain't even did nothing to nobody, you know? But it was it was crazy, you know? Um, the things that I've seen along this journey. And I'm losing friends left and right. I'm, I've been, I didn't seen wars, man. I didn't have to, I didn't have to join the military to see war. I seen wars on our streets. Yeah. I've seen kids killing kids. I've seen, I've seen, man, I've seen babies get killed, man. Babies. And that's when I realized I was like, man, no, that's not what we, that's not what we're here for. But I get out of prison in 1999 and, uh, I get out, and then in the beginning of 2000, I got shot 22 times. I survived that, and I walked in. I was mad. I was mad that they shot me. I wasn't mad, you know. Uh, well, actually, I wasn't mad that they shot me. I was mad that they let me live. Hmm. I said, "Man, I'm getting everybody," and so I was, you know, I told my buddies. I was like, "Man, look, check this out. I'm about to start a war." Y'all can come with me, or you can stay. But I'm starting the war, and I'm I'm like, they'll never get another night's sleep as long as I'm breathing. And I made sure I definitely made sure that they that they didn't get another night's sleep. I was like, no, y'all, you better not go to sleep. I'm, I'm, I'm I'll shoot up your house. I do all of that good stuff. I'm gonna shoot up your house. You know, if I see you walking down the street, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat you with a baseball bat. I'm <laughs> no, we we're not gonna do it. Um, and that went on for probably about a good six, maybe nine months. Finally, we, they called the truce, say, Hey man, we gotta, we gotta do something different. I said, no, give me the people who shot me and I'm gonna do something different, you know? And, uh, they were like, we can't do it. I said, then we're going to war again, but you will give them to me because they shot me and let me live. Now. We got to, we got to, we got to do something different, but you know, you're going to have to give them to me so I can finish this. Other than that, I'm getting everybody. Eventually, um, we did call a truce and became peaceful. And, um, my life changed, um, throughout all of that because I, I was just tired. I think at that time I was creeping up on maybe just over 22 years of being, of being in the gang. And it's two years after that, I, I had been homeless, you know, a few times throughout there, in and out of hotels, in and out of county jail, you know, all of these different things, losing everything over and over and over and over again. And that's just the way that it was. I just, I just kept losing it. I couldn't figure out why. I, I, and then I just said, you know what? This is karma for the things that I've done. That, okay, if, if, if I got to pay for it, you got to pay for it too. So, because I'm not stopping. I was, I thought I was going to be a crip for life, man. Crip yeah. for life, right? No, man. When I say, when I say I was tired, I was so tired, man. I was tired of looking over my shoulders. I was tired of being shot at. I was tired of being shot. I was tired of th these hands. I was tired. They, they hurt. I was tired of fighting. Yeah. I was, I wanted it to be over, but I, I was in the beginning, I was too scared to take my own life. So I wanted somebody to kill me. So I did. I, I went out there and I was, I knew, I knew who had the guns. And I was picking fights with them, left and right. Do it. Go ahead and do it. I don't care. They, they, they wouldn't even do it. So I got mad. I was like, okay, well, maybe if I pull a gun on you, you would shoot, you would shoot me. Um, that got me in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. A lot of bad decisions because I was doing that. A lot of people got hurt. A lot of people got hurt. And I don't understand why, because I gave them, I was like, do it, right? But it's survival instinct. It's like, I just can't let you do it to me. You're going to have to earn this. If you want me, you're going to have to earn this. And I thought about it for a minute. And after I've done that so many times, I finally said, you know, I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. 
And I got to live with these tattoos. I got to live with the scars. I went to I went to the so-called OGs. I said, look here. I don't want to do it no more. I, I want out. You got 24 years now. I want out. They said, no, you only got one way out. I, tell, I pulled out my gun. I said, there's a hollow point in there. Don't mess. But either which way it goes, I'm done. They thought about it for a second. They came back. They said, you know what, man? You got over 20 some years in this thing. There ain't too many people. There ain't too many people that survived the way that you have. So we tell you what, we're going to cut you loose. But you can't come back to the hood. And keep in mind, when you leave here, the other people, they don't know that you're not a gangbanger no more. You're going to have to deal with that without any protection. Best of luck to you. And I left. I said, okay. Now, this had been pretty much my whole entire life, right? My whole entire life, except for little moments. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know where I was going. I just knew that I just had to get away. My life was very lonely, very, very lonely. You know, watching people die all the time. Um, you learn not to get attached to people. You know, you learn. And when you've been as homeless, been homeless as many times I have, you learn not to get attached to places or things or anything like that. You just, you learn how to, you learn how to be alone. You learn how to just keep your mouth shut and you learn how to just move, right? And I've been all over the place. I really have. I've been all over the place. Um, let's see. 2000, let's see. Uh, 2002, I moved to the mountains. Got connected with another dude. Ended up going to prison in Arizona for a year. Lost everything again. Got out of Arizona, came back here. Was homeless again. Moved around um, until I found myself down in Lakewood, Colorado, and then Nevada, Colorado. I'm just moving around from place to place, you know, working little odd jobs, um, trying to put a little money in my pocket. And then, uh, I met I met one of my good friends, um, and he said, "Man, look, I got a I got a garage that has a room in there, you know, two seventy five a month." What do you think? He said, "Yeah, man, it's better than what I got." So I moved in with him, and three months later, I met another guy who said, "Man, I I got a house down in Denver, you you know, five fifty a month. It's a one and a half bedroom, bath, you know, you got everything, nice nice yard, dog run." You know, all of these things. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Right? Now, I'm an alcoholic at this time, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong alcoholic. I'm drinking, I'm, I, but I'm not thinking anything else of it now, you know? Right? I'm still trying to fight my demons. But I'm thinking life is changing, right? I'm thinking life is changing. It's, it's getting better. I got a good job, you know? Um, now I got a roof over the top of my head, and now I was 32 at the time. That was the first time in my life I ever had a roof over the top of my head that I could call home. Other than that, no. I didn't know what it was like to have a home, except for when I was a kid. But even then, it wasn't mine. That was my mama's home. Now I got my own place. And I'm like, man, I'm thinking life, I'm thinking life is getting good. It's really getting good, man. Making pretty decent money. Um, I got more women I can shake a stick at. You know, I'm living my life happy now. At peace, somewhat at peace. And then I met my son's mom. She was supposed to have been a one night stand, but she kind of stayed around type thing. Yeah. And then she ended up getting pregnant. So I'm living in Denver, Colorado at the time. She lived in Loveland, Colorado. I ended up moving up here with her because she bought a condo. She was like, I'm not going to buy it if you don't want to come up here. You know, I'm only going to buy it if you come and move in with me. So I ended up moving in with her. 
and uh, December 18th, um, she gave birth to a baby boy, my baby, my Bubba, my Jake, right? Beautiful, beautiful baby boy. Beautiful, man. And um, that's when things really took a turn. When my son was about six months old, his mom decided that she was going to destroy me. I didn't know what a narcissist was. I found out the hard way. Hmm. I didn't. I, I never even met nobody like this woman. I was like, man, she, you know, she can't be that bad, right? I know I was wrong. I, oh, trust me, I was wrong. <laughs> that woman destroyed my life, man. She, she ripped me apart She's like nobody's business. She, I was down to the bare minimum when she got done with me. Then she told me, you're not going to see your son no more. I'm going to take you to court. And I still want you to take care of him, but you can't be around him. I was like, well, I'm not doing none of that neither. Either you're going to let me see him. You're going to let me be a part of his life. Or I guess we're just going to go to court. Well, we did. We went to court. And the courts tore me apart yeah. for two and a half years. I finally got visitation once a week. Cost me $22 for two hours to see my son. And I did that. During this course of time, this woman got me evicted out of my apartment because I finally got into another apartment that she helped me get into. Then she got me evicted out of there. Then she got me fired from my job. And I had a good job. I was making about six grand a month. She got me fired from that job. Then she got my first vehicle taken away. So then I went out and got another. I got, as a matter of fact, long story short, she got me fired from four jobs. She got two of my vehicles repossessed. And then she got, she got me evicted out of two places. I was just like, man, this is crazy. Now I'm homeless again. I'm homeless trying to figure it out. Right. And I didn't know. I did not know. But her daughter was like, my mom is a narcissist. What is this narcissist thing? What, what, I don't know what a narcissist is. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard this term before. All I knew was killers, dr <laughs> killers drug dealers, game bangers, and pimps. Now I got to deal with it. What is a narcissist? Because if that's what that is, I don't want no parts of that. Right. And I've never met a person. I've never met a person that devious. She was so, she was dangerously smart. Hmm. She was able to manipulate people and have them help her destroy my life. Finally, I said, you know, something inside me said, stop fighting. Tony, stop fighting. Watch what happens. Learn how to forgive. I was like, I can't forgive. I'm homeless. She just wanted to strip me apart. And she got my son. When I tell you life, life, uh, life got a little bit better after two and a half years, they finally caught her. All the things that I've been trying to tell them, um, they finally realized I wasn't the bad guy. I was actually the good one. So then I get into a place. <laughs> this is funny how this one happened, right? So as all of this is going, I'm not seeing no end in sight. So I'm not knowing what's going on in her home, you know, uh, until until this happens. So I, you know, I'm homeless there. I'm homeless now. I meet a girl. She goes, why don't you move in with me? I think to myself, yeah, it gotta be better than being on the streets, right? Yeah, so I move in there with her. Six months later, she moves out of the place and leaves the apartment to me. So now, now I, got a, I got a two bedroom duplex, a garage, nice yard and everything, right? Three months after that, I get custody of my son. After two and a half years. Hmm. Three months after that, I get custody of my son, fully furnished every day. Now I got, I got my little boy. Um, but now here's the problem. I don't know how to be a father, nor do I know how to be a man. So now I have to, I have to figure, I have to figure this thing out. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go to these men's groups and surround myself with good men and good fathers and and, and kind of be like a fly on the wall and listen, you know, how are you doing it? This, that, and other, right? Then I realized that these guys didn't know what they was doing either. And I was like, well, that, that's not really helpful. Um, and that's when I started to rely on my faith, right? I started, I started exploring a relationship with God. 
And I, and I, and I just remember saying, now I'm not a very, I'm not a religious person. I do believe in God, just not the religion. I, have, I struggle with that from time to time. But I say, God, if you teach me how to be a man, I swear, you know, you never got to worry about me anymore. If you teach me how to be a father. I swear I would give him the best possible life. But I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. So I need you to teach me. And God said, not only am I going to teach you how to be a man, but that little guy that you got right there, he's going to teach you how to be a father. He's going to teach you how to be a good parent to him. Okay. He did. He taught me how to be, he taught me how to be a good man. He taught me how to be a good father. Me and my son was like this. Um, I stopped drinking. I stopped cursing. I stopped womanizing. I just wanted to provide the best possible life for my son. Now, during this course, I had lost my father when my son was six months old. And I lost my younger brother when my son was nine months old. So, and then October 31st, 2015. Now, me and my brother, again, we we're like this, man. Everywhere I went, he was on my hip because his mom pretty much was a narcissist. She was like, well, I work three jobs. You can keep him. And, and, and so she rarely was around. I was like, yeah, give him to me. Just give him to me. I'll raise him. Hmm. I'm already doing everything as it is. Like, you know, he's with me all the time. October 31st, 2015. Um, he suffered a major overdose because his pharmacist mixed his medication wrong. Um, very wrong. Talk about a very scary moment. I've never been scared of anything in my life. But I'm scared because they people came and said, he's not going to make it. We don't know what's wrong with him. So this is the hospital now telling us this. Uh, Monday morning, he woke up. That was to see that. October 31st, 2015 was a, was a Saturday. I remember because I took him on a play date, right? That was his, that, that was our Saturday day. Play date. We go, we go chill. We go have some breakfast. We're going to, um, go out, do some fishing, maybe, you know, go catch a movie or something, right? You know, Father Sunday, you know, this Sunday we're going to go to church. Um, we're going to have some, we're going to have some breakfast or brunch when we get home and you're going to go outside and play with your friends. And I'm going to be lazy and lay on the couch and watch the movies while you're outside playing with your friends. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, after that happened, he, he did wake up um, that Monday. And they couldn't figure out how. I said, I don't care how. I'm just glad that he woke up, you know. So after that, took him off the medication, was going to leave. We're going to leave Colorado, go somewhere else, kind of start over. Um, nine months later, June 14th of 2016, he got sick. Didn't know what was wrong with him. And then a parent's biggest fear happened on June 16th. My son passed away from unknown causes. I had to watch my son pass away. I live with that every day. Two years after that, my, father, my, my mother passes away on my uh, July 25th of 2018. And here I am again, you know, trying to figure out life, not, not understanding. Like, I was mad at the world. I wanted, to, I, look, I wanted to destroy this world like nobody's business. I really did. I was like, man, I would destroy the world. I would destroy the stars just to get my son back. Why do I have to be in this much pain? What did I do? I've done everything I was supposed to do. I was obedient. I was obedient. I was a good father. Why? Why? And then I thought to myself, you know what? You're not going to beat me. You're not going to beat me. I'm too tough for this. life tore me apart. I ended up making really bad decisions and I lost everything. I ended up, I ended up, um, 
I ended up leaving Colorado and going to Rapid City, North, uh, South Dakota, uh, with a girl that I thought I was going to be with. And I'm coming back three months later because I found out the girl that I was with was a racist. Right. So I'm, now I made a really bad decision. Now I just lost everything. I lost my company. Um, I lost my home. I lost everything. So now I got to come back to Colorado, try to figure this thing out. I came back with a chip on my shirt. It's like, I'm not going to get beat by this. So I started, um, I started the road upon entrepreneurship, started surrounding myself around different entrepreneurs. I'm learning. I knew what I was going to do. Um, none of that came true. Eventually, now I'm just bouncing around from people. It's like it just sounds good at this moment. Like, nah, oh, man, I'm gonna do this, that, or another. It just sounds good. I didn't do any of that. Life tore me apart, and uh, I began to plan on my suicide. And I began to play 3D chess with people. And finally, I got that one weekend. You know, that one weekend where I knew one nobody gonna mess with me. I am going to Utah. Hmm. I am going to Utah, and I drove out to the middle of the Moab Desert. I had this thing mapped out, man. I had it mapped out to the very last detail. I'm going to do it. No one's going to be looking for me. No one knows that I'm here. But the animals, I know there's scavengers around here. I'm going to do it, and I know they're going to pick me apart. By the time they even figure out what's going on, they're going to find little bits and pieces of me, right? It's going to be done. I wanted it to be done. I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of losing every doggone thing. I'm tired of not knowing who I am anymore. I'm missing my family like nobody's business. I told myself, I said, you know what? This would be the best thing for me. Who's going to care? I didn't even think about my younger sister, right? Still in Virginia, trying to figure out life too. I didn't think about her. I didn't think about nobody. I just thought to myself, who is going to care? I'm just another black kid in the world. No one's going to care about me. I can be done with this. No more bill collectors coming after me. No more, no more any of this stuff. No more pain. I can, I can be done. There was something that changed. I was no longer afraid to die. I was no longer afraid to take my life. And I came this close to doing it. Two seconds away. Two seconds and I would have been done. Um, as they would say, divine intervention. This voice came across and called my name. I thought somebody followed me because it was just as clear as day, right? I'm jumping around like, who followed me? No one knows that I'm here. Somebody followed me. Now I'm in the middle of the desert. It's dark. It's dark as all get out, right? You know, and I turned on the lights on my vehicle, only to realize that I'm in the middle of I'm in the middle of the desert, pitch black, um, stars are out, and there's nobody there. So now I'm thinking to myself, I'm going crazy. Right? I'm I'm literally going crazy. I wasn't going crazy. That was my journey. That was that was what started it all because at that moment it made me reflect on my life and everything that came about with it. Now I wanted to be a victim so bad. No, you don't understand. Like, why why did I have to get molested? Why did I have to go through this? Every time I did, there was another question that came, another answer that came about. Hey, had this not happened to you? You wouldn't have been able to help that kid out over there that it happened to. The kid would have committed suicide. Well, why did I have to go sell drugs and things like that? Because you needed to learn how to survive. Why did I have to be homeless so many times? Because if I would have kept you stable, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to move you around to where you needed to be. I moved you around. Where you, I was like, why I had to be homeless so many times? He goes, yeah, you might have been homeless, but I provided for you every time. You may have been hungry for three or four days, but I made sure that you ate. And when you ate, you have plenty. Why did I have to get shot? Hey, count your lucky stars. It could have been a lot worse. There was people that have been shot less times than you with one bullet. And I took them away. You've been shot 22 times and nothing hit vital organs. Think about that for a minute. I said, why did I have to lose all my friends? 
He goes, oh, you thought that had something to do with you? I had nothing to do with you. See, all of that stuff there, right there, you putting yourself in a situation that you didn't even understand. That had nothing to do with you. You just had an emotional attachment to them. But you didn't see what they were doing behind. They got what they needed to get. That's why you lost them. I didn't guarantee you that they was going to be with you. You all made choices. They made theirs. Now I take them away. I said, well, why did you have to take my father and my younger brother? And the voice said, they weren't yours. They were mine. You had, you had almost 40 years with them. They weren't yours. They were mine. Your younger brother needed to be here with me because he was sick. I said, well, why did you have to take my son and my mother? I'm an orphan in the world. He goes, because your journey is so much bigger than this. But let me show you something. Everybody that's, that you miss, he's still here with you. I did like this. I said, well, what am I supposed to do now? And the voice said, I got you. And it began to help me understand what I was going through, this grieving process as a male, and what it really looked like. And I said, you know what? I better go get some support. Now, I'm going to tell you, this journey moving forward was just funny. It, it was fun and funny in the same sense, right? Because when I started putting it together, I was like, man, they don't get no crazier than this. Because when I drove back to Colorado, I said, I'm going to get, I need to get into some support groups, surround myself with other men so I can learn how to, you know, what what's going on with me, right? And so I started going to support groups and did that said, hey, these groups are for men, women, and children, right? So I go there thinking there was going to be some men there. There wasn't. So then I, I'm looking around, I'm like, okay. So I went to another one. There's still no men there. And I'm walking away, and, it's, and the light bulb went off. Hey, did you notice something there? So I asked myself, said, where's all the men at? Oh, they used to come, but they don't come anymore. Ding, another light bulb went off. Huh, now I know why. Men don't talk around women. They don't talk around women. Why not? Well, we're providers and protectors. The masculine nature. I can't show weakness in front of you. I need to show you that I am a suitable mate that I can protect you. Now, although these men probably had significant others, it's the nature of a male to be the hunter, the provider, right? The protector. Hmm. Okay, now that I understand that, what am I supposed to do? So now I'm sitting around, I'm thinking to myself like, man, there's a huge gap in this thing. Um, put it, put it. You know what? I was sitting around my buddy's garage and I was going, I was like, man, I think I'm going to start a nonprofit so I can be surrounded by other men. My buddy was like, man, you crazy. I said, yeah, I am. I don't know because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so we sit around his garage. And he's like, all right, if you're going to do it, what you going to call it? I said, man, memories of me. Memories of, and, and, and it was called memories of me. Then I looked it up and I found out there was another name. Then it dawned on me, memories of us, my memories of us, because men don't carry around pictures of their loved ones. Why not? Because if we can keep it up here, we can protect it, meaning that you cannot take it from me and use it against me to hurt me. Oh, you know what? Memories of us, men's grief support. Now, I've never had social media. And this is, uh, uh, let's see, when was this? This is five Five years ago, so 2019, early 2019 is when I was started, you know, putting everything together. Then um, I was like, well, how am I supposed to do this? I'm an introvert. I don't want to be around nobody, you know, but now I've identified something inside of me and it wouldn't let me go. This thing was like, hey, you, I'm here. Ding, 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 ding. I'm not letting you go. We, we're going to have to do this. And there's this thing called grief. It's this thing called grief. And I was like, man, 
what is this? What, what, what is going on? I, I taught myself how to be mindful. I taught myself how to sit with my grief. And I became, I became a student. And grief became my mentor. It became my guide in life. And it just started just manifesting itself. And I said, well, I need to get the word out. But I'm an introvert, right? So how am I supposed to do that? And then I met a person at a job that I was working. He introduced me to someone else. They introduced me to someone else. Now I'm going to seminars. I'm going to conferences. I'm going to different, all these different, I meet different people. I'm like, that's not me. Hmm, that's not me. But it was me. So now the doors are opening up. And I'm telling people I'm excited about this nonprofit that doesn't exist. But I'm speaking as if it does. And people are like, oh, my God, such a huge day. I'm like, yeah, yeah, right. Um. And let's see, COVID happened, but I wasn't going to let it go. I wasn't going to let it go. I had a, during COVID is when everything started to solidify itself into the world, right? Um, Memories of Us became a, a, a nonprofit, something material. I've never done anything like that before. You know, um, the concept, the mission statement, the vision. Everything started to lay itself out. But I still, you know, although I'm manifesting this thing, I'm still having a hard time to get men to come to the groups, right? So that's when I started podcasting. I started the Memories of Us podcast, um, probably about a year and a half, a year, and eight months after. And I was just like, man, I need, to, I want to have conversations with men. I want to showcase their grief stories, things like that. Grief, grief became this thing with me. It was a part of who I was, but it it was a beautiful part of who I was. It taught me so much. So now I'm doing these podcasts and uh, I got people helping me. I got a production team. Didn't know what I was doing, but I just knew I was going to do it. I wanted to, I wanted to um, build this nonprofit the best way I knew how. And I was just that guy like, I'm going to do this. Maybe that'll help, right? Yeah. Um, COVID, COVID made me go virtual and I started going social media, right? Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, Instagram, all these things that I had no idea how to use, but I knew I was going to use it. And people's like, man, Facebook is too personal. I said, man, I'm going to use it for business. I'm going to use it to build my business. I stayed true to it. I really stayed true to it. Next thing you know, um, I'm meeting people. And people are like, man, what is this thing? It's like, I'm a men's grief coach. You know, I, I help them out with suicidal ideation. I help them out with addiction. I help them out with their mental health. You know, all of these different facets that came along with it, you know? And I got these certifications. I became a peer recovery coach. I became, you know, um, a suicidal, a suicide interventionist. I became a grief coach. I became um, all of these different things, right? A podcaster now. I never thought about it. Okay, let's see where it goes. Then, from there, I was in Loveland, Colorado. I ended up going completely virtual, leaving my office space. I got an office space, but I ended up leaving the office space. Went virtual, was working out of my podcast studio, still trying to push the envelope, still trying to figure this thing out. And one day, you know, I was like, man, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it. This is hard. This is really hard. It's hard to get men to talk. And one day I was doing virtual, I was doing virtual groups and one man showed up. I was like, that's enough. Right. Next thing you know, you know, I got two and three men to show up. Then I get 10 men to show up. And, I, and then the next time I would get eight men out of that 10 men to show up. And it just kept growing that way. Then people started going, hey, man, can you show me how you did this? I started forming partnerships, right? I started talking about this thing. I started going and talking in schools about men in grief and, and, and all of these beautiful things that came along with it. And then from there, it was, it was just became this thing that I could not, I could not live without. I could not live without. I couldn't, I knew that this was what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to provide resources for these men. 
And I did. I started doing it. Then they say, no, life would have it. Life said, hey, we're going to challenge you a little bit more. So now I lost my production to it. <laughs> And so now we're just going, okay, well, I don't I no longer have a podcast, so what am I supposed to do from here? I'm gonna figure this thing out. Ten months later, I started the Grief Let's Talk About It podcast. So this oh, actually eleven months, uh, eleven months ago, I started the Grief Let's Talk About It podcast. And it was, since that time, I've hosted two global grief conferences, which I've now I turned into a, a charitable organization. I wrote a book. Um, I've traveled the world. I've guest spoken across the world. I've formed partnerships internationally and nationally where I'm providing to right now over probably 50, 60,000 men. You know, virtually, in person. I, I got into a new office space. And um, I've been walking this path since then. And I told myself, um, because I built built back my relationship with God. I said, God, if you allow me to continue doing this, allow me to use this gift till I got nothing else left. I promise I'll be a great servant. Allow me to do this. Not only did God allow me to do it, but he says, your life, that, your life that you know right now is I'm going to change that. And he did. Changed it some good too, man. I'm, I'm happy in the world. Yes, I still hurt. Like, you know, the, the pain doesn't go anywhere, but it's, it's, it's different for me now. The pain is now um, a message. Hmm. It's, there's, a, there's a blessing that came along with that. There's a connection that came along with that. All because I surrendered to my gift. And I said, you know what? I now know what my purpose is. To build a legacy. And that's what I've been doing this whole time. For like the last five years, I finally understood that I've been building a legacy. And I said, you know what? I am going to be successful. I am destined to be successful. I wrote a book that went international bestseller. First time out, I was like, what? What is in the world is this, right? And I did that. Um, I've, I've met celebrities. I've talked to thousands, if not millions of people across the board. And I'm just now getting started. That's an amazing story. Um, a lot of, there's a lot to that. Um, when you were six, you said you're never going to let anybody hurt you again. Yeah. Is that, maybe this is hard to know, but people that get involved in gangs, do you think that's a common thing for them to have suffered abuse in their lives? I'd imagine they don't talk about it. Not too really. Much. Not really. Okay. Um, most people that join the gangs is because they're missing something at home, right? right? You know, because when you grew up in the projects and grew up in the generation I grew up in, we was pretty much by ourselves. We raised ourselves. We was. I'm a Gen Xer, right? So I was born in 1974. Yeah. Um, I got into the games because I wanted an outlet for my anger. I wanted, you know, it, and it gave, it provided me just that. Most guys would join the games because they are searching for family, right? Uh, but you also have to remember when the games first started, it wasn't started as you know when the Crips when the Crips first started, it wasn't started to be a game. It was started to protect the neighborhood. Yeah. To protect our children. When the wars and things started happening, people started joining the games for protection. I'm I will fare better if I'm with them. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? Because out here by yourself, you're not going to survive. 
You mess around and go in the wrong neighborhood, whether you game bang or not, you might get killed. Hmm. It's better. To, it's better to roll with people than to roll solo because um, you got a better chance of surviving. I joined the game because I wanted to fight. I wanted to do damage to people. And you got a handful of people like that that do come into the games that have had traumatic things happen to them. And they're looking for an outlet. They're looking for somebody to tell them that things are going to be okay. Unfortunately, when we get a hold of them, it's like, things are going to be okay. Here's a gun. See that dude over there? Shoot him. Shoot. So there's your there's your ups and downs right there, right? Not everybody joins the gang because of traumatic experiences. Traumatic experiences change us while we in the games. Because that's unhealed trauma. That's um that's generational trauma. That's cultural trauma. Yeah. But then you become desensitized to that trauma. And you begin to tell yourself, I'm going to hurt you before you hurt me. And then you realize there's no rules to this thing. Yeah. Was that anger, that that desire to fight, did that stem from that abuse at six? It did. My, it, it wasn't, okay, let me, let me rephrase it. It wasn't a desire to fight. It was a desire to survive. Mm. Right? Because once you had the certain things happen to you, you realize that the world is full of really dangerous people. Yeah. And it doesn't matter because they look just like look just like us. Yeah. Right? So who do you trust and who do you not trust? Well, it's very simple. You don't trust. But you better become you better become what you need in order to survive in this environment. If not, your family's going to be burying you. So it was that desire to um, survive by any means necessary, meaning that whatever I have to do, that's what I'm going to do. Or if I had this, if I had an inclination that you was going to try to do something to me, I was going to do something to you first. Whether yeah. if you're, that's with your intentions or not, I don't care. I'm going to get you first, period, point blank. You know, uh, had I been wrong? Yes. I was, I've been very wrong on several occasions. And what it did, I had trust issues, right? I, relationships, a lot of failed relationships, um, a lot of lonely walks, a lot of, a lot of being alone in the world, yeah. not afraid yeah. to let people in because I didn't know what they were going to try to do to me. I, I had friends, people that I knew in the gangs that set me up to get killed. People that I knew. And I was like, nah, no, yeah. mm -mm. I, I'm better off on my own. I'm better off not having any emotional attachment to anything or anyone. So women, mm -mm, I'm not the one for you. I'm not the one. You might want to get to go get that dude that got the college degree. Because my lifestyle ain't cut out for no, for no, for, um, for people that care about me. It's cut out for people that are that are similar to me. Yeah. We have a real good understanding. If you get out of line, I may have to do something really bad to you. I'm I'll make your family cry. And it was the same day, it was the same across the board. I knew. And, but it was it was honest. Yeah. It was honest and it was truthful because it didn't give any guarantees. It only says, if you survive the day. You got one more chance to survive tomorrow. And, but if you don't survive the day, no one's going to care about you. You're just one less game banger in the world. That's it, man. When people look at the world, it seems like there's a hard thing to reconcile when you look at the world sometimes. When you're, you know, if, if you've, lived a life where you haven't maybe hurt people too much or or you haven't had to be put in extreme situations sometimes it it can be really hard for people to reconcile how they as an individual can 
approach the world and maybe they inherently trust people and they try to see the good in people, but then there's this other part of the world where they they encounter or at least maybe get a glimpse into where people can treat other people with disregard for life. Um, people can, you know, people get robbed for material possessions. People get mm-hmm. killed for stupid things all the time. People get yeah. killed for like a watch, you know, something like that, or just whatever's in their wallet. And uh, it's hard for people to rec- reconcile what's going on there. And I think you might have touched on it. I think uh, that lack of trust in other people is probably the cause of that. Like you, you encounter me in the street, and your mentality is, "I don't, I don't trust anybody unless they prove that." I can trust them, or maybe there's is no way to prove that there you there's can trust no them. There's no way to prove it. So you act as if everybody is untrustworthy and everybody is basically a threat. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very correct. Um, because again, when when you've been through as much stuff uh, as I've gone through, and several other people have gone through very, something very similar. Um. And they look, and the people that try to do these things to you look just like us. Mm-hmm. Why would I? Why would I give you the opportunity to get me? Uh. Why, why would I trust you enough to let you into my world and not understanding your intentions towards me? No, no, no. Do you know you stay right there? You stay outside of my world because if you creep up into my world, I'm going to take you out. I'm, I got to get you out of my world. You don't belong here. Yeah. For those individuals that have never experienced anything like that, and they do get a glimpse of this world. See, I got to a point to where when they did get a glimpse in this world, I would go over there and be like, look, you don't belong over here. This is not for you. you go back over there. Go back to this world where you're safe. You don't belong in this world over here. You coming over here into this world get you killed. Go back to where you're safe and forget that you ever seen any of this. But if you get caught up over here again, you have been warned. So go back and live your life. Go back and get that college degree. Go get that corporate job. The same for you. I was that guy. I was that guy because when you've seen so many people get killed, you get tired of seeing dead bodies, right? You get tired of telling people's families that, hey, you know, such and such got killed. Um, Sorry. You get tired of going to funerals. As a matter of fact, you stop showing up to funerals. You just go, ain't no purpose to it. I know how many people did look. I used to take pictures, a, a timeline of pictures where I had all of my buddies around me. And then one day I took a picture and realized that it was just me. I said, man, that's a lot of people that have died. So no, um, I don't wish that on no one. I would encourage people to stay, stay where you're safe. When, when you're in a gang, when you're living that life, if you can try to explain that mindset, when you see that that person living the corporate life, when you when you come across people who are living that safe life, living in a two bedroom house with a fenced yard and uh, a family, what's your mentality toward that? I mean, is that just an inaccessible part of the world, or is it? No, um, now, see, in the beginning, like, I never knew people lived like that. Yeah. But now, living the life that I live now, I find it fascinating. I want to learn. I want to learn how you did it. I want to be a part of that community. Because, for one, if I could learn how to be 
financially stable, I can do so much more for my for my little sister and my nieces, hmm. my daughters. Right? I can invest my money. I can begin to have those things that I thought that was not possible. I can have the nice house and I can have the land. I can have that horse. I can raise cows. I can have chickens. I can do some gardening because guess what? I am no longer in the gains and having to watch my back from everything that I do now. My perspective has changed. I want to have this successful business. I want to have this successful podcast. I want to meet people because I realize I'm still a student. Yeah. And I want people to mentor me. Because for one, if I can learn this, I can now go get that guy that's in the gangs and I can mentor him. I can give him information. I can help him get out of the hood and help him have a good family. Give him something that I don't have. A chance to, to actually not just survive in the world, but thrive in the world. And maybe he can pay it for it to the next person. And they can pay it for it to the next person. I didn't become successful just so I can go and leave those behind me behind. I became successful so I can reach back and grab those people and bring them up and say, look, let me give this to you. Let me help you become successful. And because those people, those millionaires and stuff that I'm associated with, they came to me. It's like, dude, we like you. Let me show you something. Knowledge is key. When you can pick somebody else up and bring them to where they can become, that's a blessing. And you tell them, you don't owe me nothing. Reach back and grab the next person. This is how we break generational curses. Yeah. This is how we get from under feeling oppressed, feeling like we have a slave mind. This is how we change the change perspective of the hood mentality and say, look, there's <laughs> so much more out there, man. This is how we become examples. This is how we create leaders. This is how we give people voices and make change. So no, I, I, at one point in time, I didn't know it existed. But now that I know it exists, I'm like, look, we, we got so much more that we can do. We don't have to live like this. We don't have to get handouts from the government. We can, we can be better fathers. We can be better parents to our children. We can have community leaders. Yeah. We can make a change to where we don't have to live in poverty. Why? Because I went from living in poverty to not. All because I said, you know what? I want to become a success story. And then I realized I'm destined to become a success story. My story became other somebody else's survival guide. So then I started sharing those stories because I realized the importance of it. But here's the, here's the thing. I realized throughout this whole time, it was never about me. It was, it was never about me, right? No. It became so much, it's so much something much bigger than me. And then I said, I'm just this small in the whole scheme of things. So let me play my part. Let me do the thing that I'm called to do. And let me help out, help out many other people just like me. So then, that one little light that I have can become a multitude of lights across the board. Let me help them become successful because they'll be able to do so much more than I can by myself. Yeah. Yeah. When you're, uh, when you're living in poverty in that kind of environment where there's a lot of violence around and stuff like that, I know as individuals, we can have self-limiting beliefs, which some of that can stem from childhood and uh, that can keep us from achieving what we really can. But is there a community aspect to that? Like you as an individual, you can't always see what's possible, but is there also like a reinforcement from the community that you find yourself a part of? Like 
no, don't look out there. It's, this is where it, this is where you are. That you're yeah. stuck here. You know. Yeah, and this now see when when you're in that environment, of course, it is passed down to you, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have to have soldiers. You have to have you have to have soldiers out here, right? So why would I, you know, in the, if you in that mindset, why would I tell you what's on the other side? If I can keep you trapped right here, because for one, if something jumps off, well, you may just become a bullet cushion. You may be my surviving grace. You know what I'm saying? This is the cutthroat world that we live in, that, that we was living in in the games. But why would I let you out of oppression? When I can keep you here with me. That no. Why why would I tell you that there's a whole nother life out there? Why would I do that? No, I need you over here because I need a gun in your hand. You want more soldiers that, that I got out here. No. It's not until you get older or somebody comes to to there that have gone through it like myself and many other men. Or people, individuals like myself that have gone through it, they went back to the hood and said, look, mm-mm. look here, man. I mean, before you get too blindsided by this lifestyle over here, let me show you what's around the corner over here. You see that house over there? Yeah, that's paid for. See those cars over there? Those are paid for. He didn't have to rob nobody. He didn't have to kill nobody. He didn't have to sell no dope. He didn't have to live in poverty the rest of his life. Oh, really? How did you do it? Come on, let me show you something, man. Let me show you. Let me show you how you invest your money the right way. Let me show you what it's like to uh, live a life where you don't have to be afraid anymore. And that's exactly what you are. Uh, Man, I'm not. Yeah, you are. You are afraid. You're afraid of what's over here because that's unfamiliar territory to you. So let me just let me just bring you over here. let Let me get you familiar with this territory because. The grain, the the grass ain't green on the other side. You just got to plant the seeds. Yeah. You got to know how to mow your more and water, water your lawn, man. What do you see yourself as? It's it's okay to dream. It's okay to write the story out of your own book. It's okay to want certain things. It's okay to want the the happy life. It's okay to want the beautiful wife. It's okay to want the beautiful mm-hmm. children. It you it's okay. It's okay, man. It's okay to be afraid. What is not okay is to stay where you are and accept this. Because just like how they lied to you, they lied to me too. But we can choose something different. Come on, let's do this. And it takes us to go back in there to change that whole chain slave mindset of not caring about one another. But it starts with us caring about each other. Those who have walked this path before, it takes us to go back and say, man, I care about you. Let me walk with you this way. Teach you a little something, something. Get you into some nice clothes. Put you into a suit. Get you into some business classes. Get you around some entrepreneurs, some authors. Mm. Let them inspire you. Let them be examples of what you can have. But that's what it takes, though. It seems uh, counterintuitive to a certain degree because. When people get into gangs, they're they're searching for something, and mm-hmm. a lot of that is a gang provides some sort of community. Mm-hmm. But I mean, as you're describing it, it's not a community that actually cares about you as an individual. It's it's more of a everyone is self serving. Yeah, in, within the gang, is that right? Oh yeah, but well, think about it, right? Why do you think we have so many gang bangers or from the same hood killing each other? Mm. Right? But, but if I kill him, I can get a name for myself. That's yeah. what we respect. Right? If I kill him, oh man, look, you just slept with my girl. Yeah. Oh man, you owe me $5. This is what we're killing each other for. 
This is we we killing each other over a street sign and on a piece of land that we don't own, as if it's ours. Nah. This is what we doing. No man, we killing each other because of the simple fact of we feel that we got no way out. We want a name because for one, if you get a name, you get protected, right? No, that's not it. You get a name, you just put a target on your head. That's all. That's yeah. all you've done. It's self serving. Yes, it is very self serving because for one, if I can go out here and make a million dollars. And leave the hood. I'm leaving you behind. I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going out here and selling million dollars in drugs. I'm leaving you behind. I ain't bringing you with me. Why would I do that? <laughs> so you can take what I got? Are you crazy? Yeah, that's the game mentality. There's also the, I mean, you said you made a lot of money while yeah. you were game banging, but I bet you didn't have much to show for it. It was just a lot of money that went in and out of your hands, That's I it. imagine, right? You, you said it right there. Look, I done bought cars that I don't have. Yeah. I done bought clothes that I don't have. I done, I done, I done ate food that I can't even tell you what I, where I was at. I've, I've been, man, look, easy come, easy go. Yeah. I got nothing to show for any of that. What I, what I do have is a lot of memories and a lot of scars. Yeah. I got a bunch of tattoos. I got a, now here's the important part about it. I got a story that goes along with it. Right? Yeah. I got I definitely got a story that tells that journey, the, the the process that I had to go through when I was in it from a very early age. But also I became an example of if you change your mindset. You can have anything you want in this world. And that coming from a place where I didn't see this. I I was hopeless. I was just I was just surviving. But it took that right there, man. And going, I don't want to be an inspiration to people. I want to be an example. I don't want to inspire you. I, I want I want to I want to be an example of what what you can have if you want it. But you gotta change. You gotta, you gotta do some things. You gotta go through a process. You gotta change your whole mindset about things. You gotta you gotta dream. Not just have nightmares, but you gotta dream. Imagine yourself. Sitting in first class, going to a going to a country, going to the Caribbean islands. Imagine yourself being on a yacht, you know, with your friends and stuff. You know, just having a great old time. Imagine yourself in that house, man. That's. I want to be an example. Something I I think a lot of people might have. So, have you always believed in God throughout your whole life? I grew up in a church. Okay. Um, I lost my faith when I started seeing people die. Mm, okay. I gained my faith when I realized that I had nothing else left. And I built that relationship when I realized that it was worth it. Mm. It doesn't work for everybody. People got to find what works for you. If it makes you a good person. Do it. Yeah, I, it seems like some people in gangs, they might wear a cross or something like that, like mm -hmm. even while they're living that lifestyle. And people outside of that world might look at it and say, how, how, do, how does somebody reconcile that? How does somebody, you know, they're committing crimes, doing things that maybe their religion would say don't do, but then they they'll still represent that cross and stuff like that and maybe you don't have insight to that since you lost your faith uh while you were living that lifestyle right, but right. I, i'm curious if you have any insights there oh well, look at it this way right everybody wants to feel protected and sometimes you know what i'm saying you have to live a lifestyle and pay for protection pay for opportunity those are those ones that actually get out mm. and they have the story of saying, man, God got me out of this. And that's okay. 
There's people that don't believe in that, right? That don't believe that there's no way out. Maybe they've seen too much. It happens. There's no right or wrong answer to this. It really isn't. You believe in something. Even atheists believe in something. Yeah. Right? You believe in a creator. Believe that there's something bigger out there, bigger than you. Right? Look, man, there's people out here that that, that are um, that are just bad people. Then you have people that do bad things. There's a difference. Yeah. Sometimes you do bad things because you got to survive. But then there's people out here that are really bad, that, that are really capable of doing really bad things to you. When those two worlds collide, only one person is going to survive. Sometimes you got to make bad choices in order to do good in the world. There's no easy way of going about it. You know what I'm saying? It, your faith. No matter what it is, it's what keeps you moving, keeps you surviving. Everybody's different. You you went to jail or to prison for a crime you didn't commit. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, you committed crimes prior that you probably didn't get in trouble for. Exactly. It, did that help? Like when you're in prison for a crime you didn't commit, but you know you committed a bunch of crimes that you didn't get caught, do, it, does that help you cope with the reality that you're in jail for a crime that you didn't commit? Or do you still feel just as wronged? Um, I never felt bad for anything I've done. Hmm. I have no regrets in my life. Right? Um, I made my choices. And um, when it came down to it, going to prison was the best thing that ever happened to me. Hmm. I was able to rest for two years while I was in solitary confinement, right? There was nobody around me. I was, I got the chance to rest. Hmm. I got the chance to be with myself and read books. So although I went to prison, um, prison never killed me, never broke me, but I grew. Most people don't get that opportunity. I was just fortunate enough to get that opportunity. Yeah. That's it. A lot of people don't, though. You know, we got people in there doing life right now that are teaching young men um, to be better when they come out and back into the world. You know, the world changed. It's giving us opportunities now. People are starting to find their voices. Even through, even through that. Yeah. So prison, prison gave me the opportunity to be a better version of myself. After I became the worst version of myself. See, good men are, are made through very bad times, right? But that's what makes you a good man. Because you got to yeah. be capable of doing bad things in order to be a good man, because that's how you learn how to control yourself. I agree with that. Um, and I think that's essentially true. I, if, like if, if you do good things or not good things, but if you just never do harm and you're, you, if you're just incapable of doing harm, there's no good in that. You're just not capable. Yeah. But if you're capable of doing harm, if you're capable of being evil and you choose to do good, I think that is better. I, I think that is more respectable. Yeah. I mean, if, if you just, cause you can just hide, you can just hide yeah. and, and yeah. not really live. And then, you know, well, ask yourself this, right? If you're not capable of doing really bad things in the world, how are you going to protect your family? Yeah. Yeah. Right? You know, if you've never done anything wrong in your life, then how do you know what to do and what not to do? Yeah. See, here's, here's the thing. 
People want to be wise, but no one wants to be a fool. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. People want wisdom, but no one wants to be a fool to get that wisdom. Yeah. Everybody wants to be a protector, but no one's ever gone to war. How do you know what you're capable of doing? See, it's easy to run from a fight. It's much harder to stand in the fight, win, lose, or draw, and go, no matter what, I'm going to show up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do what I got to do. Just the bottom line of it. Chainsaw, art of war. It is better to be a warrior in the garden than to be a gardener in a war. Very true. It's really just that simple. I'd rather be the I'd rather be the warrior in the garden because if you bring a war to my doorstep, I got something for you. I'm not running, but we will fight. I'm giving you the opportunity to walk away though. Leave me in peace. Because if you change if you start this war, I'm then I'm gonna I'm gonna show up. Yeah. So I would rather you just let me be a gardener and not see what I'm capable of doing. That's that's what martial arts is, right? Martial arts doesn't teach you. It, it, martial arts isn't training you to be dangerous so that you can go out and be dangerous toward everyone. Uh -huh. It's actually teaching you to be dangerous so that you hopefully never have to use it. Exactly. So that you can, because there's a restraint element to it. There's a there's an element to, and you're going to learn this. You will become lethal. You will become dangerous to people if you use this. But that's the other element. You're t you're learning to practice restraint and not do it. And I mean, that's why often the people that are some of the most dangerous in fights, most reluctant to fight. They're usually not the ones that are going yeah. to. They be the ones trying to talk you out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey man, that's, like, that's you not don't do want to do this. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't, let's not do this. Let's go to to something different. You know. Yeah. Um, but that's. That's the nature of the beast. Yeah. It's it's a yin, it's a yin and yang, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You have to respect it. Um, well, you don't have to respect it, but it's it's good, respectable, because when that person is trying to stay peaceful, it's because he's already been to war. Yeah. He knows what he's capable of doing, but he chooses and says, I'd rather have my peace. Yeah. We don't want chaos anymore. Yeah, it's a, it's just a reality with people. I think it's interesting because you'll you'll meet good people that haven't necessarily have, had a hard life. I'm not going to say that you can't be a good person without going through some stuff, but the people who have a lot of depth, a lot of wisdom, knowledge. It, like you said, it's usually because they were a fool. Um, and I, yeah. I say this all the time. Like, if there's anything I know, it's because I didn't know it before. It's because I, I was dumb and I've made many mistakes in my life. And now I'm like, you know, 39. I have a few things that I know. But yeah. I'm still, I'm an idiot I'm walking 50, around learning. Right. I'd be 50 this year. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom that came along with 50 after all the mistakes that I've made. I was like, okay, well, this is, but you know, um, again, I don't regret anything in my life. Yeah. I've lived a very, very interesting, unique life to, in order to get to where I am right now. None of, none of my path was wasted and I'm not a victim, not a victim. I was, I was a survivor, but now I live. Right. So the price that was paid was paid in full. And now my reward is that I get to live the life that I dreamed about and leave a legacy so that the people that I love and have loved live on through the work that I do. I get to give back. Right. I get to, I get to give back to people through my experiences. Isn't that worth something? Yeah. It's worth the next person's life. 
to give them my story so they can live a fruitful life and not have to make the mistakes that I've made. To provide resources and support to those men out there so they didn't have to struggle the way that I have. That's worth it, man. Do you, did you ever have a victim mentality? Did you ever feel like the victim? I did. Okay. I did. And that's where it changed for me when I realized I wasn't a victim. Yeah. That moment when I was out in Utah in the desert. Yeah, I wanted to be a victim. I couldn't do it. My life experiences wouldn't allow me to be a victim. Because I realized that everything that I've ever gone through, I was supposed to go through. I was supposed to walk the path that I've walked. I was given everything that I needed. Protection. Food, clothing. Although I didn't have a lot, I was given everything that I was needed. Everything that I've gone through was given that I had to go through in order to help someone else. I may have just had to go through. But through that experience, I was able to give so much back. So now, I, at one point, yes, I wanted, I, I did want to be a victim. But then I realized it was all part of the process. It was all part of the journey. So now I, I can't be a victim anymore. Aside from, or was it maybe just faith that allowed you to not be a victim? Because I mean, your your low point in Utah was after your child died. And I mean, a death of a child is, I've heard, I've heard it explained or I've heard the analogy said before, when you lose your parent, you lose your past. When you lose your child, you lose your future. And I feel like that rings pretty true. Mm-hmm. I luckily have not lost my parents and, um, uh, I don't have any children, but it rings true to me because when you have children, you have children with the expectation that they're going to outlive you. According to whom? When you lose a child, you're losing your future, like that you planned for that child to live longer than you. Mm -hmm. And if there's ever a moment where someone has a good reason to feel like a victim. I feel like it's when their child dies. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you not, how did you prevent that? Here's the reality. The reality is, is that who promised you that? Yeah. Life never promised you anything. We lie to ourselves and say, this is what we're going to do. There's people out there that will never have the opportunity to have a child. I may have lost my child, but I got eight years with him. Yeah. That's, that's gratitude. As far as the future and things like that, I told myself these things, but life never promised me or guaranteed me that these things were going to happen. Not once did it guarantee it. So I got mad when those things didn't happen, but I had to face the truth. Life is not fair, is not unfair. Life is truth. It never said that I'm going to give you this. It's never said I'm going to give you that. Life says, if you show up, you may get challenged. Then it says, Buddy, who are you going to be in those moments of challenge and adversity? If you can become a good person as well, I will give you something bigger than what you ever thought. Maybe not. But we can't lie to ourselves. There's no guarantee. Look, since the beginning of time, people have been losing children. What makes us any different? Who says that we're exempt from these things? Yeah. That's the truth. There's nothing that says that our children are supposed to outlive us. 
It's nothing that says that we that we're supposed to outlive our parents. We tell ourselves these things to make us feel better in a world that don't promise you anything. Yeah. Because we want to feel good about it. That's all. So you you decide to go to meetings where you're expecting to see other men Mm -hmm. supporting each other for grief. So at that moment, you need support. That's it. Seems like that's what you were actually going for. You weren't going there to support other men necessarily. You were going there because you needed some support. So both, both. See, okay. what I did not understand. I'm going to these groups because I am looking for support, but I'm looking to learn. Yeah, I'm looking to learn from men who have been through it, right? Um. And then it dawned on me that these men weren't showing up because, well, this, this it, men don't do this, no. right? And somewhere down the line, the worlds got reversed. Um, and I started this nonprofit. And again, with the same notion of I want to surround myself with other men so I can learn. And then I realized those men that were that I was trying to surround myself with, they were coming to learn from me. Hmm. How did you do it? Man, but you in such a great space how did you do it so it was um it was a really give and take on both ends right i give i want you to take i take because you give it's a mutual it's a mutual thing and there's healing that came along with that because i did learn from a lot of people and there was a lot of people that learned from me I had no expectations. It just became this blessing, kind of hard to explain, right? But it was, it was part of it was part of this journey of learning, being being a um, being a student, and then being a mentor, and you know, um, being a servant, not a leader, but being a servant, understanding my journey. And helping others, helping others gain the tools so they can understand theirs. Understanding grief, so I can be more effective in the area of this thing that I call um, my gift. Yeah. And in turn, I help other people find those avenues to become better along their journey. So when I look over. I see these men and it makes me smile because I see who they become. I do it because it's, it makes me feel good. It just makes me feel good, man. Yeah. You say you're an introvert and obviously the, the path you take that you've taken is Kind of not the introvert path, right? Like it's not the path for uh, that you would expect somebody who's an introvert. And not that introverts can't do things that are social, but they tend to need a lot of recharge time after a lot of social yes. activity. And when you're dealing with grief, it you're it's a really emotional thing too. So mm-hmm. I'd imagine that adds on top of that. How do you how do you recommend an introvert? deal with grief in the right way because an introvert is going to be a lot more likely even more likely than most men to just withdraw completely and Mm -hmm. and not find any support or talk to anyone about it and just kind of keep to themselves well two things um as an introvert, you have to find your tribe, people that understand what it's like to be an introvert, right? You know, mm-hmm. understand understand that you do need, you know, like you you may have a small window where you can go in and get that support, but then you have to retreat to go to recharge, right? Understanding that too. Um, and understanding that you need to take some baby steps, right? If you're not comfortable with something, don't do it. If you need to do something, do it. Don't be ashamed. If you don't want to talk, don't talk. You got to remember, you got to remember this. You know, grief is yours. 
It's your grief. You got to do it the way that you do it. There's no right or wrong way to do it. You just got to figure out what works for you. So if you need to sit around for a couple months and be isolated and things like that until you get tired of tired of it and you can peek your head out a little bit and maybe grab something and bring it back into your little closet and everything where you can sit down and dissect it, do that. Hmm. You don't have to necessarily go out there. It's not for everyone. Maybe you need a couple of videos that you can watch on TV. That's okay, too. Being an introvert or an extrovert doesn't really matter of how you choose your choose how you heal. As long as you choose to heal. Right. So. There's there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's, you got to figure out what works for you. When it comes to. Grief and loss. People around us don't always know how to deal with that because death is a very uncomfortable thing for people to deal with typically. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a normal situation, normal social situation with friends or family and they haven't experienced the same loss as you, and maybe they have lost, but it's not experienced around the same time, it can be very uncomfortable. And you can notice this on people. Like mm -hmm. if you're dealing with something and you you bring up a death or something like that. People get very uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Is that why we need support groups? Because we need a place where it's okay, where it's acceptable to discuss these things and actually air these feelings that we have in a setting where we're not going to be, because it could feel like rejection when, when you want to, when you want to talk about your feelings, but other people don't want to talk about they don't want to talk about death, you know? Okay. Um, to answer that, um, no, you don't need support groups. You need community. Hmm. And community, we connect, right? Yeah. Um, the reason why death, dying, and grief um, feels very uncomfortable to some people is because we haven't normalized the talk around it. Yeah. These are things that are going to happen. Yeah. In your life. They are a normal part of your life. If you're uncomfortable with it, it just means that you're not in this you're not in a space where you're ready yet, right? But you have to surround yourself with people. Because once you realize that you're not meant to do it alone, then you can begin to open up because you can listen to the conversation that they have. But you have to surround yourself with people who have gone through things that are similar. That's how you that's how you become comfortable. You cannot be comfortable with something you've never been taught. And it takes you being around people who have gone through it so you can learn. Yeah. You can learn that it's OK. You can learn that, you know, what you're going through is totally normal. You can learn that you can learn to um, slow down. Learn to cry. Learn that you're a human being. Learn that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to ask for help. But you have to be around people for that. So it takes people, it takes people stepping up and wanting to hold that space and be in the space with those individuals. So no, you don't necessarily need support groups. You just need to find your tribe. Yeah. You gotta find your community, man. That's where you make the difference. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, we have the uh, red pill movement that you see around on like social media and stuff where people, mm -hmm. it's weird. It's like a mix of, it's like stoicism taken to some weird extremes sometimes. And mm -hmm. I'll see, I'll, every once in a while, I'll come across people talking. And I remember seeing a post where somebody said, um, I would never cry around my woman because that it would show weakness or something like that. I just remember I'm like, man, if you can't cry around your significant other, you don't have a real relationship. You and or you've never experienced real loss. Like, because there's moments that you can't there's you're not gonna be able to keep from crying. Like when certain things happen. Like it just very true. Uh, you you have to 
I, I feel bad for people that don't feel comfortable crying and not that you have to cry all the time, but it's a real, it's a real thing when you experience real loss. It's not that they, it's not that they don't feel comfortable. They're afraid of being judged. Hmm. Most men are afraid of feeling weak around other people because we don't want them to think that, I, that I'm going, that you can, that I, we don't want other people, especially the women in our life. We don't want them to feel that we can't not protect them. It's the whole thing that we're being taught. We need to go back in and relearn. Human beings, we are born with emotions. We're born knowing that we're going to experience some sort of traumatic loss. Yeah. Whether it's a sibling, a child, a parent, a good friend, a grandparent, as long as you have relationships, you're going to experience it. We're taught. We're taught that um, we're not going to experience it, that our loved one's going to be around forever. That's why we have these conversations. So people understand a lot more. It's not going to happen overnight. But it one person at a time. Community, connection, making it okay to go for therapy, making it okay to understand that, hey, maybe your life messed you up a little bit, making it okay to go, I'm hurt and I'm angry without judgment, but through compassion and empathy. And in a lot of cases, a lot of love from people that look like us. Then coming to you and saying, Amen. How you holding up? How you doing? And truly meaning it. Not diverting the conversation, but truly saying, How you doing, brother? And when you say I, I understand what you just said, and I too. Let's go sit down. Let's go talk. You might not want to talk. I may not want to talk neither. But in this moment, I want to let I want to let you know that I'm here. Just leave it like that. Whatever you want to do, that's what we do. Hmm. You know? Yeah. How do you how do you coach people or help people keep from letting other parts of their life suffer when they've suffered grief? Like if, if you suffer grief, sometimes you want to close off. It can, it can interfere with other relationships. Maybe you lose a child, you have another child. You need to be there for that child people can struggle with that or or maybe they're going to have a child down the road and they you know the grief can leave a lot of feelings of like i'm just going to lose the everything i love i lose you know things like that that those feelings that people can go through and and feeling of not wanting to be attached how do you help people with dealing with that, not wanting to get attached to people again? First thing, they have to want it in order for them to be able to receive it. Um, I don't really do anything special. I surround them with other men and let them make the choice. Then from there, I take things that I've gone through and I lay it out on the table. I said, and I say, you can use these things if you want. You don't necessarily have to use them, use everything at the same time. Use what's appropriate for you in the moments that you need it the most. I'm just a small portion in this thing. 
All I can do is just provide you with the information and the resources. And when you make that choice, I walk with you. I let you know that, hey, being a man is so much more than just being being um, masculine. It's being thoughtful. It's understanding compassion. It's understanding education and wisdom. It's understanding that maybe we need to teach life in a different way. You're going to experience hurt. You are. It's inevitable. We have to understand that. So when I see someone who has lost a child, I know how to speak the love language. When I see somebody who's lost parents, I know how to speak the love language. See, the thing about men, we've been so conditioned not to speak that we learn how to speak in a different way. And what I mean by that, when men grieve, it's like a foreign love language that no one speaks. You just got to understand the foreign love language. As a man, we all speak it. Just got to understand it. Depending on the situation which you've gone through, or depend on the love language that you speak to that individual. That's the key to it. It's understanding that everybody's going to understand what you've gone through. And that's okay. Now ask yourself the question. Do you want everybody to understand what you've gone through? Because there's enough of us that has. Or would you rather surround yourself with the, with the, with the um, people who have? I say surround yourself with the people who have. Yeah. That's how you begin to turn things around. Huh. That makes sense. Um, the one thing, one other thing I want to ask you is, I mean, you've, you've lived a life that I'm sure you would like to see more people avoid, um, you know, gang lifestyle. What's one thing that you think could really contribute to that? Like what's one thing societally we can do to, reduce the amount of the allure of gangs? Like what's something that you think we can do as a society to help with people that are considering that or, or getting mixed up in that? And I mean, you've, you're, it's hard because people that are young, 11 years old, like you were 19 years old, 20 years old, like men don't really mature fully until they're about 30 years old. And I mean, who knows if we ever fully mature, but <laughs> like, but like, especially with like a young man or a child, like how do you, because when we're young, we don't see the future. We don't really understand mm -hmm. that, especially if you're not living uh, surrounded by people who take the future into consideration. How do you, help people who are in that i mean they're usually only thinking in the short term how do we yeah. change that um very simple man um very very it's complicated but simple surround yourself with people that want your that see your best interests in heart hmm. in your community people that look like you people that have gone through some things that can tell you from the experience right Surround yourself with people who are good, who is good for your mental health. Those are the, going to be the ones that take you by, by, by your shoulder and going to walk with you and deter you from going down the same path because their words, their words would be truthful. They're going to tell you about being shot. They're going to tell you about going to prison. They're going to tell you about the consequences of everything that you've ever had to experience. Or, or that you're going to experience, right? And then from there, you walk with them in truth. 
Yeah. Then you can begin to get them to make better choices in this world because they're going to look at us with the silver hair on our chins. They're going to look at us living a better life than what we started off in, right? And then we become better examples. Then they look at this and go, man, I like that. They ain't going to follow you, but they'll listen to you. They can make better decisions. They can grow up and go, you know what? I don't want this life for my family. Let me go out here and do something different. Let me start this business. Let me make a goal to become a, mil- become a millionaire. Let me make a goal to become an author. Hmm. Let me explore the other opportunities that are being granted to me. Because, man, if that dude can do it, I know I can do it. And that's the purpose of it, right? We opened up the doors for the younger generation to do better than what we did. Yeah. And But we keep them on that path, too. Come on, man. See what y'all did. I'm going to check up on you. Make sure you're all right, man. I got you. I mean, you need me to mentor you. I see you. I see you got a couple of C's and D's in, in, your, in your school grades, man. Let, come, let's sit down real quick. Let me, let me see what's going on because in this conversation, not only am I going to mentor you to get your grades back up, but I'm also trying to feel where you are in life. And then every time you turn around, I'm going to be taking you and surrounding you by some other people that are out there doing some amazing things. And I ain't, I'm not going to enforce it on you. I'm just going to let you be around it. To show you that people like myself, we've been there. But look at what we're doing now. Yeah. So that's how you deter them. That's how you get them there. Do you, have, uh, do you have books that have influenced you in your life um, that you would recommend to people? It wasn't books. It was motivational speakers. Mm, okay. Eric Thomas, Inke, Inke Johnson, Les Brown, uh, Tony Robbins, um, Gary Vanacek, um, Coach Payne, uh, Mel Robbins, uh, um, other podcasters, Joe Rogan, Jay Shetty, Shay Shay, uh, all of these different individuals were the ones who influenced me as I began to go because I realized that they lived a life like that, right? But they all managed to turn it around and do something better. And I was I was intrigued with that. I was like, man, I want to have a have a number one podcast. I want to, I I, I want I want I want the I want the nice house. They gone through this. Those were my silent mentors. So I'm not like everyone else. I was able to look at that and go, man, that's what I want. Yeah. Because I'm tired of this. I'm tired of being tired. I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of wanting, wanting food. These people have gone through what I've gone through. Let me figure out what they did. Because I've eaten out of trash cans. But Eric Thomas ate out of trash cans too. But he became a multimillionaire and a, and a motivational speaker. He'd written books. He's traveled the world. I want to do that. See, inside of me, I knew what I wanted. I just didn't know how to go about it and do it. So I had to learn from people who was doing it. So that was my inspiration right there. Because I wanted something different. I made a choice. And I said, you know what? I am destined to become a success story. And no one's going to take that away from me. Because, see, I got a sister that's dependent on me. I got a niece. I got nieces that are dependent on me. Although I'm in a whole different state, I got friends that are dependent on me to become successful. Yeah. You know, and, and I use that. Because, man, I know what it's like not to have. I don't like that feeling. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to get the easy road. I don't like that feeling either. I'd rather go through I'd rather go through my storms. I'd rather learn. I'd rather be challenged. That way I can learn, right? Because then that way I can teach other people. Right? That's me. Not everybody's gonna follow that path. But they can follow a path 
to get them there. You just got to be willing to go through your fair share of storms, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got to be willing to heal. You got to be willing to be changed. You got to be willing to surrender. You got to be willing to receive. Um, and you have to be willing to be a student of whatever it is that you want. And that's the key to it, man. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned being, you mentioned learning quite a few times in the interview. So I I respect that. I I'm I'm a lifelong learner, and I, mm-hmm. it's something I can respect. Uh, Tony, it's it's been awesome talking to you. I really appreciate the conversation. Um, before we wrap up, I want to just hand it over to you to tell listeners where they can find you, where they can find your nonprofit, your book, anything else you want to share today. Yeah, of course. Um, my book is called Relentless, uh, Overcoming Stories of Adversity. I co-authored this book. You can find it on Amazon. Um, and uh, so you can go to my website if you guys need or looking for support or if you'd like to donate, it's www.mensgriefsupport.org. You can find me on Facebook as Tony Lynch. You can find me on LinkedIn as Tony Lynch. You can find me on Instagram as Men's Grief Support. Um, I am all over. You can find my podcast, which is the Grief Let's Talk About It podcast. We do live streams. We're primarily on uh, YouTube. So you can go to my YouTube channel and check that out. Um, other than that, you can email me at tolynch46 at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, we can set up something. We can definitely, you know, get you where you need to be um, if that's where you need to be. You know, once we figure out what what's going to work for you. But yeah. Awesome. Tony, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to fractalzoo.net where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing, Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience. So find me on Twitter or X at RDTM podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at thoughtfully mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.